بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت الحكيم العليم اللهم انشر علينا رحمتك وأنزل علينا حكمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم افتح لنا فتوح العارفين بك والصلاة والسلام على حبيبنا المصطفى صلى الله عليه وسلم الفاتح لما أغلق الخاتم لما سبق ناصر الحق بالحق والهادي إلى صراطك المستقيم وعلى آله حق مقداره مقداره العظيم I want to welcome everyone to this week's session uh, This is one of the simplest hikam and it actually is the summation of the entire book It's one of my favorite It's one of the most famous sayings and it's actually the hikmah that we did in the introduction video. So we have reached hikmah number 12. And if you don't remember any of the other hikam, this is a good one to remember, inshallah. Nothing benefits the heart more than seclusion that enters you into the space of contemplation. مَا نَفْعَ الْقَلْبَ شَيْءٌ مِثْلُ عُزْلَةٍ يَدْخُلُ بِهَا مَيْدَانَ فِكْرَةٍ Nothing benefits the heart more than seclusion that enters you into the space of contemplation. So we'll start with the question of what. So this hikmah is about uzla. So remember we talked about intention, we talked about sincerity, we talked about amal, we talked about the asbab, taking the means, we talked about the outcomes. Uh, and we talked about uh, being insignificant, right? And disappearing in terms of our social context. Now here, we're talking about something different, which is the idea of seclusion. So we have to define what is Arzla. The topic here, Arzla, is solitude. It's a kind of khalwa. It's a kind of spiritual retreat. Now, of course, as soon as you hear these words, you might think, well, what about the cases in which there's something that you're required to do for something else? This reminds us of the very famous story of Salman al-Farisi and Abu Darda. Actually, Dr. Tariq, he referenced it a couple months ago in the beginning, I think in the first session of the 40 Hadith, in which the wife of Abu Darda, because Abu Darda and Salman al-Farisi, they were, they were paired. Remember, the, they were not related by blood. How were they related? They were related because one was Muhajir and one was Ansar. And the Prophet ﷺ had matched them together. And they were also Abu Darda and, um, and Salman al-Farisi were both regarded as Ahl al-Sufa. They were from the Zuhad of the uh, companions. They were from the companions that were not interested in partaking in dunyawi matters, worldly matters. They were ascetics in terms of detaching their heart from anything that was material, anything that was tangible. Now, even in that case, when Salman al-Farisi was visiting Abu Darda, he spent some time with them. He spent the evening with them and he observed the routine of his food and his sleep uh, and his habits. And what did he notice? He noticed that Abu Darda was completely engrossed in his ibadah. He was so busy in fasting that he had no interest in eating. He was so engrossed in, in, in praying the whole night that he didn't spend any time with his family. And so he inquired from the wife of Abu Darda regarding this. So, yes, was from Faris, yeah. Abu Darda, he's from Mecca, yes. But these were from the very simple companions, both of them, right? These are some of the most famous members. Uh, Abu Dar al-Ghifari, for example, another famous uh, Abu Huraira, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. These are the famous people from Ahl al-Sufa. So there are some names that we know and there's some... Uh, names that we don't really know that much about. But these are the ones that we know a lot about. 
right? And so Salman and Farisi, they were paired together. Because they were paired together, they would check up on each other, right? Because the Prophet he made, he basically matched the Muhajiri and the Ansar together. They became brothers. Even though they're not connected by blood, they're connected by that tie. Now, Salman al Farisi, also a Zahid, also an ascetic who's not interested in wealth, not interested in business, but he noticed that Abu Darda had taken it to a whole different level, in which, in his view, he had neglected his family. And so then Salman al Farisi told him that, in, and these are the very, they became very famous words, that, Inna li rabbika alayka haq. surely your Rabb has a right over you. Of course, the right being to worship. Uh, and your family has a right over you. And your body has a right over you. Don't abuse that body. So give each one that has a right over you its due right. Each one has a right. So everything should be proportional everything, nothing should be neglected. And so Abu Darda was still not convinced. It sounds good. <laughs> but he's like, how could it be possible? I mean, we don't know what he's thinking, but we can imagine that Abu Darda is concerned that there's no such thing as, it's like, uh, how could there be too much of a good thing, right? So some people are guilty in this, you know, we, uh, when, uh, especially when we're cooking, we like a certain spice, so then we just put too much of it. And this, there is such a thing as too much of a good thing, right? And then it ruins it because now it's not balanced. And the human being is the same way. If you become, and, and for young people, if you become so engrossed in sports, then you might neglect your academics. Now, on one hand, that thing is beneficial because it provides you with structure, it provides you with team building. There's a lot of skills that can be developed, but if you become so engrossed in it, then you neglect other things in your life. So if you have parents, then you have a right, there's a right to your parents. If you have children, then your children have rights over you. If you have a spouse, then they have rights over you. The Prophet ﷺ was told about this incident and he approved the words of Salman al-Farisi. He approved those words. So that what it shows is that there are cases in which khalwa would be a bad thing. In which secluding yourself, running away from those duties and responsibilities would be a bad thing. However, most of us are guilty of too much socializing. Very few of us have retreated ourselves so much that as a result, we have neglected our social responsibilities. So in most cases, and especially for those who are on this journey of suluk, of Islamic spirituality, of behavior, of that tarbiyah, of spiritual conditioning, usually it's not that we're neglecting responsibilities. Our problem is that we get so distracted by what other people think and what other people are doing that we are not able to enter into that spiritual space of connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now that khalwa, that kind of retreat, that uzla, is not for its own sake. Everything we do in this religion has to serve a greater purpose, which is Allah's pleasure. There has to be some isal al faida So the benefit here is to the heart. And that's what's mentioned in this. ما نفع القلب شيء Nothing benefits the heart. So there's a taqdeem here in which the heart is mentioned first before the seclusion is mentioned. Nothing benefits the heart more than seclusion. Rather than the author saying that seclusion benefits the heart. He said nothing benefits the heart more than seclusion. Because the emphasis is not on seclusion. How you get to where you're going is important. But the most important thing is that you know where you're going. And so what really matters here is the emphasis on matters of the heart. That to have that consciousness and awareness that everything that comes in, everything, all of our senses are having an impact and effect 
on the heart. And so when we withdraw from people, it's for a purpose. The goal is for our heart to be connected with Allah. Our spiritual conditioning is to condition our heart in order to connect with Allah, in order to ascend, in order to draw near to Allah. But that spiritual process cannot happen in a vacuum. Where does it happen? And this takes us, now we've moved from the what question to the how question. How is it that we spiritually engage? The way that that happens is يَدْخُلُ بِهَا مَيْدَانَ fikra. Maidan. This word Maidan, it's hard to know because nowadays if you open a map in Arabic, you'll see Maidan Plaza or, you know. But classically, in classical Arabic, the Maidan is an open field which is specifically used for horses. But of course, in modern Arabic, <laughs> it's lost that meaning. But originally, of course, the horses was the main mode of traveling. And when we think of horses, we think of freedom. We think of independence. We think of strength. So Imam Ibn Ata'illah is analogizing the human being who's on the spiritual journey to being like a horse that has to be let free in an open area. So the way in which we condition ourselves to be with Allah, to receive these nafahat rabbaniya, these spiritual winds, is to be open. So you have to have bust, you have to be open. If you're constricted, then you won't be able to receive that from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And actually the entirety of our lives is about conditioning and training of the heart. Didn't Allah say in the Quran, يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ That we're all going to face Allah on a day in which no wealth and no children will be of any avail. إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَ اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ Except for the one that comes before Allah with قَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ A sound heart. Allah is indicating that it's the soundness of the heart, the health of the heart that matters. Like the Prophet ﷺ said that in fil jasati mudga, there is a piece of flesh. Ida saluhat saluhal jasadu kullu. If it is upright, then the whole body is upright. Wa ida fasadat, and if it is corrupted, fasad al jasadu kullu. Then the whole body is corrupted. Didn't Allah say in the Quran, wa inna min shi'atihi la Ibrahim, that from the ones associated with Allah are Ibrahim? from his friends, from his allies, is Ibrahim. Why? What was special about Ibrahim? When he went to Allah, did he go to Allah and visit him? Physically? No. We come to Allah without moving an inch. Ibrahim came to Allah and was with Allah without moving an inch. When he went to his Lord, بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ so the vehicle, the way that you connect to Allah is when your heart is sound. And that means that this, the heart has to be healthy. Now, there are many things that hold us back. And you might think, well, I don't have bad companions. I don't have bad friends. But who is with us in the living room? YouTube, Netflix. Now it's TikTok. I was listening to Bloomberg on the way. Every, I don't know if every, anybody follows the stock market, but Meta has lost uh, over 70% of its stock value. It was over $1 billion in market valuation in a matter of weeks. It's unbelievable. Unprecedented in human history. Of course, they've, I think they've invested over $15 billion in um, AI and the Meta which is fine, but investors are not that happy because they want money. <laughs> They're not interested in that. They're interested in, in getting that. But part of the reason is that their bread and butter uh, is, is social media. And TikTok has grabbed over 30 something percent of the market share because people are just going crazy over TikTok. So we're like, well, I have good friends. I have good influences. But what are the voices that we're hearing on a daily basis? People literally take their phones with them to the bathroom. <laughs> it, 
like we can be disconnected even for the most private thing in the universe we're so connected we're all guilty. i'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hand we're all guilty of doing that at some point or the other but the point is what is the last person that you hear from is it the person sleeping next to you or is it a video that you watch on your phone right so this is a problem that when we talk about companions, when we talk about influences, when we talk about media and consumption, these are your companions. It's not only the friends that you associate with. So as a Muslim, we have to reject that idea of going with the flow. We live purposeful lives, principal lives, in which we select, we have to, you know what the word I'm looking for is we have to curate our media we can't just read every magazine and every newspaper and every article we can't necessarily engage in every social media platform and it's not for me to tell you that is for you to evaluate and for me to evaluate what are the things that i'm allowing into my sensory universe because these inputs all have an effect on my internal condition. And as they say in Arabic, they say, Al uns his, right? So the intimacy, so we don't want our desires to take us astray, but we can find intimacy in the world of the sensory. So now here's the thing if we focus so much on pleasures and desires and things that are that we can sense, that what ends up happening is that there's a detachment that happens internally because now it's not the heart guiding this guiding the body it's not the heart leading the senses but rather there's a disconnection right so what we should be doing is that we should be using our his our senses in a way that serves the internal what's a beautiful example you have the sabha so some people, they say, why do you do tasbih with your fingers? Both are fine. If you want to use the tasbih or you want to do it with your fingers, uh, both are good. But why do we do it in a sensory way? Why don't we just repeat in our minds, La ilaha illallah, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Why don't we just do it that way, astaghfirullah? Why is it that we are engaging our senses in that way? Because now the heart is the maestro of the body. The heart is the conductor. The heart is leading everything. And so similarly, there are some people when they read the Quran, they're just looking at the words. And then there are others that they're listening to the Quran, they're reciting it with their tongue, and they're hearing themselves recite the Quran. They're engaging all of their senses. And so now the heart is leading and the body is following that leadership of the heart. So by putting the heart first, Actually, it creates more unity. Because when you separate the senses and the pleasure, the parts of the body and the parts of the nafs that seek pleasure and the heart, that disconnection creates a lot of turmoil. And then we wonder why people are suffering from anxiety, suffering from depression, suffering from multiple personalities, suffering from all the other personality uh, defects, other personality disorders. Part of this is because the heart is not at the forefront. We've not elevated the heart to make everything subservient to it. So this is a very important. Solitude allows you to do that. Why? Because you're hitting the pause button. Now it allows you to do an assessment. Now you're here and you're doing an inventory. What do we have? What do we not have? What do we have to work on? If you don't do that inventory, then you won't know what you're running low on. You might be leaking in something that's, that's very essential. So solitude is to step back and to find that comfort in being alone. And in fact, that's part of the human being. The word insan comes from al-uns. The human being finds true intimacy when we focus inward. Believe me, if you're always looking at other people, you will never be able to find yourself. 
because you'll never, ever, ever get that validation from other people. People will never, ever be happy with anything that you do. And so you have to find that solace and that joy and that satisfaction and that acceptance and that self-love that comes with embracing that ubudiyah then you come not only to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you see beauty in his qada, you see beauty in his decree, even the negative things and the bad things that happen to you, you see a beauty in its wisdom. Later on, you're like, now I know why that happened to me. It was because of this. And then your iman, liyazdadu iman and ma imanihim. Their iman it increases on top of the iman that they already had. So that intimacy is only when you engage in that self-love, in that acceptance. And reflection is also a kind of himya. It's a kind of diet. It's a kind of, that worship requires you to be a gatekeeper in which you have to regulate. So similarly in medicine, sometimes you have to tell a patient, the doctor has to tell the patient that that might be halal ghairihi. For someone else, it might be very good, but for you, it's toxic, right? Because for you, your body can't handle that. I mean, glucose for somebody who uh, uh, has a very low blood sugar could be something that could save their life. But for another person, it can put them in a coma. So it's the same sugar, it's the same glucose, but depending on the patient, it can have D d different it can have dangerous effects but different types of dangerous effects depending on the situation so what is the medicine that this class is about that this gathering is about it is the medicine the prescription of fikr because fikr and reflection is what facilitates the dhikr it's what opens the heart to that connection and remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a lot of people, they do the dhikr, they go to dhikr gatherings, but they don't feel anything. And that's because they're repeating the words with their tongue, but their mind is distracted. Their heart is disengaged. It's closed. And so unless your heart is in an open position in which it's ready to receive, like a sponge, then it's not going to have that effect. And partly it's because we are a people that got used to popping a pill. You want to lose a lot of weight, pop a pill. You have an exam coming up, cram for the exam. People that have mental health issues, they just pretend they're like fake it to make it. They want to pretend that things are normal. People have an issue at work, put a Band-Aid on it. Avoidance, avoidance, avoidance putting out fires, putting out fires, but we never get to the root cause. We don't address the emotional and the spiritual needs of the human being and of ourselves. Because we're in denial, we want to just keep moving on. And fikr allows you to really take that hard look. And that the knowledge that you're trying to attain is not a knowledge of fiqh and where to put your hands. All of these are important. Somebody from this ummah has to do it. You don't have to be the keyboard warrior arguing with people on the internet about gender issues, about LGBTQ, about whatever the issue du jour might be. It's not your problem. Your issue is about ma'rifatullah about knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that is the thing that pertains to your very existence on the face of this earth, right? Now, one of the beautiful things that Al-Junaid al-Baghdadi, uh, one of the very, very early Sufi thinkers um, said, he said that أَشْرَفُ الْمَجَالِسِ وَأَعْلَاهَا الْجُلُوسُ مَعَ الْفِكْرَةِ فِي مَيْدَانِ التوحيد. Beautiful statement that he said the most noble of majalis, of gatherings, and the highest of all company is, in majalis, he's not talking about social gatherings, he's talking about sittings or scenarios, is that position of reflection. That is in the domain of a tawheed. So people sometimes they emphasize tawheed, tawheed, tawheed. Tawheed. And this is why some people, they're like, well, 
if you have kibr, then this is a shirk al-khafi, because the Prophet ﷺ, he warned us that I fear for you, from you, a shirk al-khafi, from the minor shirk, from the, from the very subtle kind of shirk. No, but to understand that, you have to understand that what it means is that by concerning, there's a deeper reasoning behind it, which is that as soon as you preoccupy yourself with whether people are impressed by you. It's not the act of arrogating yourself. It's the act of you elevating their opinion of you over your, your preoccupation with Allah's opinion of you. That means you're prioritizing society and people over Allah Rabbul Alameen. That is how it becomes shirk. So as soon as you do that reflection on the realities in, in creation, then you realize a tawheed. So before we wrap uh, this thought up, there are 10 benefits that Ibn Ajiba mentions to Khalwa. Number one, salama min afat al lisan. This is an obvious one. And this is an easy one. You're going to get this from day one. As soon as you kind of retreat yourself from people right away, you're saving yourself from all of the harm, from the diseases of the tongue. You're going to backbite less. You're going to have less conflict with people. You're going to save yourself from all of the sins that come from just simply talking too much. Number two, you will protect your eyes and the defects of the gaze. Fudul and nawa. Even if you don't have a bad intention, there's a habit that we end up just people watching. Our eyes wander. It leads to unmitigated desire. I mentioned about TikTok before. This unprecedented usage of social media has accentuated insecurities among people in terms of their appearance, in terms of uh, spousal satisfaction. Because who can compete with these fake images that have been airbrushed and filtered? And so people end up feeling bad about themselves because they can't compete with this, these imaginary people. And what ends up happening is not only does it bring that insecurity, but it also brings out a desire that a person absent that would not have had. They start craving something because society says that this is something which is desirable. And it brings out a darkness in the heart. Because then as a society, we are all objectifying each other. And subtly and slowly, we all become prey to that way of thinking. The third one is protecting the heart from diseases. And the main diseases of the heart are arriya, showing off as we mentioned, and flattery. Fourth is az zuhd When you spend, when you retreat yourself, then you focus on the akhirah. As the Prophet ﷺ said, if you show zuhd in the dunya, Allah will love you. If you show asceticism, if you renounce worldly things, Allah will love you. And if you renounce the things that belong to people, then what will happen? nas. Then people will love you. So this is one of the byproducts. If you follow this formula and stay away from people, one of the amazing things that will happen is actually people will like you even more because you're not in their business. You're not disturbing them. You're not bothering them. You'll find that people only have a better opinion of you because sometimes we manage, 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 manage. We're trying to manage our, our persona, our public persona, our PR, our public relations. But people can see the difference between what's fake and what's genuine. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he loves a person, he tells the angels, I love so-and-so, so love that person. And then the angels, they obey that, and then they start to love that person. And then the angels, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, instills in the hearts of people a love for that person. The fifth thing is it protects you from bad influences, from bad companions. Six, it frees you up for worship. Because we waste so much time running around, going to this function and that function. And I'm not saying that you can't go, but don't be so engrossed in it and obsessed with those gatherings and constantly having to know everything and what everybody was wearing and what they were doing and why they were doing it and 
how much they paid for it, all kinds of extraneous information that we don't need to know. Seven, given the ability to taste the sweetness of worship, that halawa. There's one uh, famous Sufi saying that said that the murid is not sincere until he finds or she finds sweetness in solitude in three things. Uh, halawa, sweetness in solitude, in nashat, and quwa. And this is very interesting because most of us, when we're around people, do we have more energy or less energy? When we're with other people doing the same thing, we have more energy, especially in Ramadan is the best case study, right? Suddenly we have this himma to like do anything. We can climb mountains, and we're ready to go. But as soon as we get home, sometimes we say, okay, tonight I'm going to do pray tahajjud. We start two rakahs, then four. We're like, oh, I'm getting tired. Then we take a break, right? We lose that steam. And so they said that until you have that, that sweetness, that nashad, that quwa, that energy, then that means that actually you're feeding off of other people's energy and not your own. The other one is raha al-qalb wal-badan. It will put peace in your body and in your heart. Nine, protect yourself in the deen from conflicts. The more you mix with people, the more misunderstandings you're going to have. The more khusumat, the more disagreements you're going to have. And then the tenth one, at-tamakkun min ibadat tafakkur wal-i'tiba. So th that means that you will enter yourself, and this is what the whole thing is about, which is that you are going to achieve the maqam, the position of, of the actual, the realization of tafakkur. Because tafakkur itself is an act of worship. And that is the highest level. This is al-julus fit tafakkur. So the best sitting that you can have is doing tafakkur. Because you might think, well, I'm contemplating, I could have been doing dhikr. I could have did salawat a thousand times. I could have prayed eight raka'at. I could have done this. I could... That tafakkur itself is the ibadah that you are most in need of. And this touches on the well-known statement that reflection of one hour is better than 60 years of worship. Now, this is a very weak hadith. Personally, I don't think it's a hadith because the two narrators are liars. But I think that it was a statement of Hassan al-Basri. It was a statement by one of the very pious early generations. But people want, wished it to be something that the Prophet ﷺ said. And so they lied and said that the Prophet ﷺ said it. But the meaning is correct. But it's not a good hadith uh, in, in any case. So the reflection is important because it's the means to realize al-haqaiq. And that's what we said on the first day, that this gathering is about realizing the reality of things. And when you look in the mirror, you can evaluate your heart. You can look at your own faults. You can evaluate the what diseases of the tongue do I suffer from? What diseases of the heart do I suffer from? Are there any blind spots? Are there some things that I'm sensitive about that I don't even realize? Are there any personality defects? Am I susceptible to, sh to the whispering of shaitan? Are there insecurities that are holding me back? Are there insincerities? Are there ways in which I'm trying to show off with other people? The person who doesn't do the fakr doesn't realize that. Abu al-Hasan al-Shadili, he said that the thimar al-uzla, the benefits of uzla, of, of retreating yourself, is that you can reflect on one thing. He mentions four things. كشف الغطاء وتنزل الرحمة وتحقق المحبة ولسان صدق في الكلمة. So that means that um, you will remove the veil on the things that were unknown to you. Mercy will descend to you. You will have the actualization of what it means to truly have mahabba, a love for Allah in your heart. And you will find that your tongue is sincere and truthful in its speech. So in conclusion, my recommendation to myself and to all of you is that tafakkur should be in the simplest form possible. The reason we are not able to do deep tafakkur is because of noise. There's so many things in the background going on. Reflect on a single thing deeply. 
understand its nature, its origin, its significance, its meaning. Pick up a single leaf when you're in your backyard, when you're out on a walk. Hold that one leaf, leaf and look at the design of the leaf and how it connects to the branches and the color of the leaf and how the photosynthesis happens and how the water reaches everywhere and how it falls in exactly the right moment. Consider your optic nerve that gives you sight. Just think about that one thing. See a creek of water. Hold your newborn baby and look at that baby and just reflect on that one thing. The Arif Billah, the one that knows Allah, everything she sees reminds her of Allah. Somebody's nice to her, generous to her, and says, offers a cup of tea. I say, Allah is Al Kareem. You are generous, but Allah is Akram. Allah is more generous than that. So every mundane thing that happens to you in your day is the actualization, the realization of Allah's beautiful names. So the entire universe to you is just a domain of seeing Allah's work unfold before your very eyes. If you really want to perfect it, choose a time to reflect, to maintain focus. And then when you do dhikr, we'll try it today, inshallah. We'll close our eyes, separate ourselves from everything, and maintain our focus in just thinking about one thing. And when we remove all the noise, you'll find that you, your heart is moved. You didn't move, but your heart moved. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pulls you. And then you are in that maidan of fikra. You're like the horse that's free. And now you're in that open arena. And now you're enjoying all of the benefits that tafakkur, that fikra, that reflection has to offer. We have a few minutes, inshallah, to take some questions. Uh, who'd like to begin? Oh, there's something in the chat. There's no audio. No, they're all there. There must be audio now. I think that was in the beginning. Okay. Yes, Sister Maryam. Okay, <laughs> I think it was okay before. Probably it was muted before we started, alhamdulillah. Um, so, okay, we're back. Okay, good, alhamdulillah. Um, so the way that Allah facilitates it is through people. And so we have such a simplistic way, and we talked about this in the Sunday halaqa, the tafsir, which is that we have a simplistic way of viewing how Allah operates. It's not transactional. It's not linear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anticipates our needs before we're even aware of it. And so his mercy and his blessings are constantly unfolding throughout our lives. And he sends 
uh, things that we need. And in many cases, he sends us the things that we need and not the things that we want. And in many cases, the, the things that we get are in anticipation of a need that hasn't even come yet. That means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is preparing you for some future event. But how could you understand that? Because you don't know that that future event is coming. Yeah, so shaitan is a different thing because shaitan is the one who is tempting you in your reactions, in your responses. But this is a secondary thing because, you know, uh, you might, uh, and that's why the abid, the one that worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that person might be very good in fending off shaitan. But, the, but only the one who is in communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is seeing everything in their lives as a manifestation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his jalal and his jamal, his majesty and his beauty. So there are certain things in your life which is Allah's jalal being shown to you. So for example, the classic example is grief. You know, we have a loved one who passes away. Allah might be showing his jalal to you. But then he might surround you with other beautiful relationships, people who will be there to, to support you and to help you and to bring comfort to you. This is Allah's jamal, which is being manifest in the same time. All right? Yes. MashaAllah. So Brother Tahir, he's, rem uh, Tahir, he's reminding us that Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا تِسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ And Allah mentions even whether it's, whether it's dry and withered or whether it's even, or if it's moist and live, except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala know illa ya'lamuha. Except that he already knew about it. So this is part of why I picked the, the, the leaf. Um, because not only that, then you can imagine... One of the dua of the Arabi, the Bedouin man, it's in Sahih Muslim, that there was a Bedouin man that was looking for the Prophet ﷺ and he wasn't there at that particular moment. And he started to make a dua. And he started the dua, if you're interested, it'd be, it's one of my favorite. I have it saved on my phone. Ya man la tarahu la ayun. Oh, you are the one who no eyes can see. Uh, and then part of it, wa ya'lamu adada. Uh, um, uh, 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 ورق الأشجار. ويعلم عدد ورق الأشجار. ويعلم, uh, and he knows that Allah is the one that knows the precise number of leaves on all of the trees put together and he knows the exact weight down to the gram of all of the mountains and he knows the exact volume of every qatar al-asjar, qatar al-amtar, the exact number of drops in all of the rain. And he knows the exact volume of all of the bodies of water and all of the oceans put together. So, you know, this is, these are the things, but whatever moves you, you might be a scientist. You might find what I mentioned about physi the physiology of the human being. You might find that that moves you. Or you might be somebody else who's moved by the sound of the Quran. It, whatever type of person. So for you, 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 you listen to the beautiful recitation of the Quran, and that is the thing that moves you. Whatever it is that puts you in maidan fikra that puts you in the domain of reflection, that is the space that you want to be in. Any other thoughts? Inshallah. So I think we're, we're ready for doing some adhkar. So as we mentioned, we've done, we're in Maidan Fikra now. I think everybody agrees, we're there. So now we have to allow the heart to open. So that means we have to focus on the spiritual heart with hearts that are full of iman, that are full of love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you want to close your eyes, if you want to uh, engage in takhliya, purge yourself, divest yourself from attachment to anything else, to anyone else other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you're carrying in your chest, 
any weight, release that weight. Remove that anguish, pain, that anxiety, any feeling of guilt. Istighfar is not to make you guilty. Istighfar is so that you can meet Allah biqalbin munib, with a heart that is full of repentance, that is returning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not out of guilt, but seeking Allah's acceptance. So with that in mind, we say, Astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah, 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 Astaghfirullah. Part of this is ridding our heart of ego. Ridding our separating ourselves from our nufus. Separating ourselves from shaitan. Separating ourselves from worries about ourselves, about people, about others. Then we can allow the tahliya, the beautification to happen. The beautification of the heart is in the remembrance of Allah's name. In filling the heart with Allah Jalla Jalaluhu, exalted and majestic. Allahu, 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 Allah, 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 
Allah 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 One of the most beautiful things is to pronounce the name of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu The letter Alif A requires you to begin in the diaphragm A from the diaphragm from your whole abdomen the letter lam requires you to pronounce la from the tip of your tongue and the ha is from aqsa al-halq is from the very last letter of the throat so simply saying allah if with feeling it fills your body and your heart with iman physically it requires you to go to the depths of your soul to say allah's name then go to the very ends and the tips of your fingers and the ends of your tongue and then to go back to the throat allah so when you go home i want to encourage everyone try it at home with that thought in mind we'll say the best of adhkar la ilaha illallah لا إله إلا الله 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 حسب ربي جل الله ما في قلب غير الله نور محمد صلى الله لا إله إلا الله حسب ربي جل الله ما في قلبي غير الله نور محمد صلى الله لا إله إلا الله حسب ربي جل الله ما في قلبي غير الله نور محمد صلى الله لا إله إلا الله 
حسبي ربي جل الله ما في قلبي غير الله نور محمد صلى الله لا إله إلا الله حسب ربي جل الله ما في قلبي غير الله نور محمد صلى الله لا إله إلا الله We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he allows us to walk in the footsteps of Al-Mustafa As-Siraj Al-Munir, the illuminated torch of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, qad ja'akum noorun min Allah, the light from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Mufassirin, they said, this is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Al-Habib. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes this a blessed gathering, that he fills us with mercy, a gathering which is full of guidance, a, guide, a, a gathering which is full of illumination. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he instills sincerity in our hearts and that he instills wisdom and knowledge in our minds. We ask that he puts honesty and truthfulness in our tongues. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he fills all of it with his Light, Allahumma nawwir qulubana bi nuri ma'rifatika abadan ya Allah ya muqallib al-qulub thabbit qulubana ala dinik ya musarrif al-qulub sarrif qulubana ala ta'atik and we ask Allah that he sends his prayers and his peace abundant prayers and blessings on his habib our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his family and his sahaba and his followers and his ummah and all of those who follow him in guidance until yawm al-qiyamah Allahumma salli afdal salati ala as'ad makhluqatika sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim adad ma'lumatika wa midad kalimatika kullama dhakaraka al-dhakirun wa ghafala an dhikrika al Barakallahu feekum. We'll see you next Wednesday, inshallah. Don't forget on Friday we have the halaqa with Dr. Tariq as well in the same time at 7 30 and Sunday morning at 6 a.m. after Salat al Fajr. So the adhan was already called, so we'll proceed with the iqamah, inshallah, with Imam Anas's permission. Barakallahu feekum.